So, uh, welcome. Welcome to BB350. How are you guys doing? Good. You're doing great. First day of class, if you're not saying great and the sun is shining, you, there's something wrong, right? <laughs> Maybe there is something wrong. I don't know. Hopefully there's nothing wrong. So, um, welcome to BB350. I am Kevin Ahern, and I will be your instructor du jour this term. And um, I'm looking forward to, as I said in my email last night, a very um, exciting term. So, I'll tell you a little bit about that excitement for me and what I hope is excitement for you. So, um, how many people have downloaded the textbook? Okay. So, uh, this is the first class I've ever taught where I completely wrote the textbook, my wife and I. And it's also the first term I've ever had a textbook where the students got it for free. And um, I think that's important. I think it's very important when I look at how much it costs to go to school and I look at how much publishers gouge students for textbooks. That was the reason I created it in the first place. Um, and because it presents a view of biochemistry that um, I think is important that I have focused very much on students. You're going to see as you look through that book, it's not like your standard textbook. A lot of the content in the class is going to be materials I'm going to be providing to you with figures and so forth that are not in that textbook. Okay? There's a lot of things that I'll be talking about, blah, blah, a lot of things that I'll be talking about that will provide you information. It may not be in the textbook. You may find things in the textbook that I don't talk about. Am I going to go and am I going to nail you on all these little trivial details? Well, I'll tell you my number one guideline. My number one guideline is that whatever I say in class is the most important thing. I am not going to go pick out obscure details of anything, anywhere that I haven't talked about in class and ask you on an exam. Okay? So the number one question I get is, how should I prepare for that exam? I say, go to my lectures. I'm videotaping my lectures. So I videotape those lectures because I think it's important for me to provide you other ways of learning the material. Okay? Yes, I want you to be here. And yes, I will make some very good incentives for you to be here. Okay? But I realize that if you came here and you were just totally focused, you still might not get everything that I had to say. So it's important that I provide to you other ways of getting that information. So that's why I write notes and highlights. And I've written you a textbook. Okay? So for me, that's very exciting. I can't tell you how um, excited I am about getting this going. All right? It's the first term. You guys are guinea pigs. Okay? How does it feel to be guinea pigs? Yeah, awesome or nervous or is that, is that good or is that bad? That's good. Okay, all right. Well, uh, what you will see during the term is the textbook is still uh, going through some uh, changes, alterations, and revisions. And so what I will do is during the term, I'll post updates to the textbook. You can download those. Okay. So whenever there's an update, I'll send you out an email saying, "Hey, there's an update to the textbook. Download this one and use it." Okay. So we're covered pretty well right now for about the first three chapters of the textbook. We're in pretty good shape with stuff there. But you'll see some updates during the term that I'll provide to you that uh, will hopefully help you to better understand the material. So that's, I think, very important uh, for me to do. Okay. So that's my excitement. I love teaching biochemistry. I love teaching. Okay. You will not bother me too much. All right. If you come see me, if you come ask me questions, you come talk to me, I'm there. All right. I'm more than happy to meet with you and help you to learn something about this subject. And I find that a lot of people come into this subject with A, anxiety. How many people come into biochemistry with some anxiety? How many people feel, yeah. There you go. Double hands back there, right? So raise hands. It's a lot of anxiety, OK? Well, I think it's important. Uh, anxiety is something that I understand. I will tell you that the first time that I took biochemistry, I was so nervous I didn't know what to do. I hated biochemistry. And look what happened to me. Right? So here I am up in front of you talking about biochemistry. Right? I obviously got over my anxiety. Part of what I want you to do is get over your anxiety about it. All right? And I recognize it's very easy for me to say, hey, get over it. You know? I sound like your parent or something. Get over it. Come on. Right? So if coming and talking to me helps you, if coming and talking to the TA, if you want to tutor, if whatever, 
helps you, I'm happy to, to do what I can to get you through that anxiety. Because when you're anxious, you're not going to do your best. Nobody does. All right? And if you cut through that some, then I think you have an opportunity to really excel. And what I find happens with students in the class a lot is they discover that biochemistry, there's some really interesting things about here. You can learn a lot about your body. You can learn a lot about physiology. A lot of you are nutrition majors. You can learn a lot about nutrition and the importance of good nutrition and how this plays into biological processes. Okay? So we'll talk about all these things this term. So that's a very, very, um, I think, useful and important aspect of biochemistry. Okay? Now, um, before I dive headlong into the material, I always like to kind of get to know my class a little bit. And you guys are about 100, there's about 110 of you in here. So it's a little uh, big to get uh, everybody to have a chance to talk. But I would like to hear from some of you in terms of, uh, well, let's start off with where you at major-wise. So how many people, nutrition, dietetics, that sort of thing. So about two-thirds, I would guess. Okay. How many uh, botany plant pathology? Okay, there's a contingent. Last time I had botany plant pathology, they all sat in one section of the room, and I called them the botany mafia. You know, that I was always afraid they were going to just like gang up on me or something, so I don't know. With nutrition and dietetics, I don't worry about that so much. Maybe I should. I don't know. Maybe they're, maybe they're more evil. Uh, let's see. Um, some aspect of engineering. None. Some aspect, or nobody's willing to raise their hand. Some aspect of chemistry. Okay. Uh, some lovers of biochemistry who are just here because they want to take biochemistry. How many are taking this as an elective? Nobody takes it. <laughs> Get real, Ahern. Nobody does this as an elective. I've actually had a few people take it as an elective, but uh, no. All right. What's your other majors? Well, oh, food science. Okay, okay. Food science. I always, I always put that with dietetics. I realize that's, that's not right. Food science gets to do the really cool things with enology and all that stuff. So how many enologists in here? I want to know you. I want to get to know you guys really well. Other majors? Animal science, that's right. I always forget to ask about animal science. Are you pre that? Okay. Viticulture, okay. Great. General science. General science. Are you pre pharmacy? Pre PA. Pre PA. I think we talked before. I can't remember. Yeah, okay. Absent minded professor. One of the things you'll find is I will recognize your faces, but by golly, I'll have to get your name about six times before I ever get it in my head. So I will apologize in advance for that. What makes you nervous about biochemistry? What do you hear? It's hard. What does it mean to say something's hard? This is the point where everybody starts looking down because the professor is looking at me, and if he looks at me too long, I know he's going to ask me a question. A lot of content, yeah. There's a lot of content. And believe it or not, I don't put the camera up there so I can squeeze more content in. Okay? I don't put it up there to squeeze more content in. You'll find I talk fast, and if I get talking too fast or going through stuff, okay, you can say, hey, slow down. I won't get unhappy. I won't get angry. I also like if you call me by my first name. Okay? I really find Dr. Ahern to be a very stuffy name. Please call me Kevin. Okay? If you call me Dr. Ahern, you will lose points. <laughs> well, okay, I won't make you lose points, but please call me Kevin. I find that's, that's um, I think it's a much friendlier uh, thing. All right, what else? What did you do over the break? Anything exciting? Wine tasting. What's that? Wine tasting. Is this the enologist here? You did some of this? Okay. Where'd you go? Uh, California, like nine Napa Valley? Some good wines? Yeah. You brought back some good ideas for Oregon wines? Yeah. Steal their grapes. <laughs> That's my advice. Steal their grapes, okay? They will never know. What else? Nobody did anything glamorous? I had somebody last year who went to Cancun. Nobody went to Cancun? What's that? No? Ah, okay. Everybody can hate you then, I suppose, right? So, Which island? Uh, Maui. Maui, okay. Did you go up in Haleakala? Oh, did you make it all the way to Hana? I did. How was it? Was it worth it? I never made it all the it was way. Worth it, definitely. Yeah, I'm glad I made it. I'm glad I made it though. Pretty much. 
It's a long trip. Oh, yeah. Very narrow road. Yes. I've been to Haleakala, but I've never made it to Hana. You guys look like you want me to start something. No? You just want to sit here? Talk to me. I'm not going to bite you. What else is, what else you want to talk about? God, you don't want to know what I did over break. <laughs> but I'll tell you, because I'm a professor. I'm paid to bore people. Uh, what I did over break, I went to two meetings in seven days. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Two meetings in seven days, and I wrote furiously to get your web page, your figures, and your book together. Well, I'm not asking for things. You may say, oh, I hate that thing, right? Okay, but it was a very, very busy break, so I, didn't, I really didn't have much of a break. So I was kind of glad to see school start. I like getting up in front of people, and I like class. So to me, the first day of class is always a lot of fun. Okay, um, any concerns, any thoughts? What kind of advice do you want to give me for this term? What kind of advice do you want to give me for this term? You have no advice for me? Nobody has any advice for me? Wear light if you're biking at night. Wear light if you're biking at night, but that's not going to help me. I walk to work. I, mean, I live pretty close to campus. What do you want me to do in this term? This is your time to tell me. Huh? It's all A's. <laughs> you know, that's the most common thing people say. And if I gave everybody A's, you know the value of an A would be this. You don't want me to give all A's. You want me to give you an A. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right? I mean, we get right down to it. Screw everybody else. I want my A, right? No, seriously, what kind of advice would you? I mean, I'm asking you, what would you tell a professor first day? If you don't tell me anything, I'll just go dive, dive right into it. Well, I'll give you what? A note sheet for an exam? A need to know. OK. Um, that's a, not an unreasonable request. Um, I do a couple things in that regard. Just, just a second, I'll come back to you. A couple things. One is after every lecture, if you go to the web page, and by the way, the web page, Oregon State, EDU, Instruct, BB350, okay? You get there, you'll get to this page, not the one that has all the bouncing crap on it. Okay? Um, that's there. And when you click on, you'll see there's access for eCampus. You don't want the eCampus. You want the classroom because they're doing a different, they're doing a different textbook as well than you are. All right? You'll get to this page. And you'll see on this page that I provide what you'll see, first of all, is the outline that we'll use for the lecture. I will provide highlights that I write after the lecture that I think are summaries of what I think are the most important things. So that's important. Uh, the video will be here, okay? And I even provide uh, streaming audio as well if you want to. Some people like in their cars, they like to listen, okay? Or it, it makes them sick and they drive off the road. I don't know, one or the other. But, uh, so those are one thing I do. And the other is I do sometimes write up a sort of summary of things, although realistically the real summaries are in those highlights. I will tell you a secret. It's not really a secret, but it's a secret in the sense that a lot of students don't get the message, and that is I write my exams looking at the highlights. When I go back to make up my exam, I go back and look at the highlights. What did I talk about? That's where it comes from. Okay? Really good thing. So if you have... Well, I would say this, okay? Does that mean I should only look at the highlights to study? I guess the answer I would say to that would be, should I only get a car that has an engine but doesn't have, two do has to have doors on it? Because you're here to learn something, okay? If you learn something more than you have to for the class, who benefits? You do. All right? So you can approach this class in any way that you wish. All right? But my strong advice to you is, as one who sat out in that chair, just like you guys are sitting out in that chair right now, is that this is the time in your life when you can have that opportunity to learn and expand your knowledge. If you're at this point in your life and you're just trying to narrow down, I only want to know what I have to know, you're in trouble. Okay? So yeah. You probably get around just looking at the highlights, I suppose. But I would really recommend that you use this opportunity to educate yourself, because that's really what's going to get you to the next phase in your life. This class, okay, will be something that will be passing. It's a passing fancy, as it were. Right? But 
What you learn in this class, I hope will be with you forever. Yeah? Whoa, how did that happen? <laughs> I haven't updated those dates, obviously. Uh, or we've gone back in time. That's also the possibility. <laughs> I will update those dates. Uh, you could, I told you I was writing furiously over the past week. So you see one of the things that didn't get done. So I'll, I'll get that taken care of. Thank you, though. You had a comment back here. Was there, was there advice? Previous tests. Do I get previous tests? Yeah, in fact, if you go down this page right here, you will see, in fact, a do, 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 practice exam. Da, 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 there you go. Well, <laughs> it's kind of like having those dates, isn't it? So, yes, I do. If you look in the book that I, the free textbook I gave you, near, uh, I think it's chapter 10, you'll see there's one section for what I call mid level biochemistry exams, and then there's another one for uh, general biochemistry exams. This is for the general biochemistry exam, it's the exams I gave in this class. So, yeah, you'll see those, you bet. And there's keys there also. OK? And yes, I have problems that you can use, et cetera. Um, and I'm really puzzled what that's not. Funny. OK, anyway, I'll get that fixed. I hope my outline works. Because if it doesn't work, then we're going to have fun talking today, aren't we? All right, well, let's see how that goes. Oh, man, what a relief. OK. All right, so most of what I'm going to talk about today is very general stuff, all right? And um, we'll start the, the term slowly. Now, I will tell you that you guys have my complete admiration, and I'm not making this up. You have my complete admiration in that we are going to go through all of biochemistry in one term. This is the only class like this that's taught on the OSU campus. We teach biochemistry at three different levels. This is a basic biochemistry class that is one term. I teach another class that's a general biochemistry class that does it in two terms. If you're a major in biochemistry, you do it in three terms. They all cover the same basic material. Who's going the fastest? OK. Now, the good thing is we don't go into as much depth as those other classes do because we don't have the time to do it. But we're still going to cover a lot of material. It's going to be a lot of material. So you really have my admiration for that. And yes, I recognize that. Um, things go kind of fast, right? Four lectures a week, okay? Four lectures a week. We have three midterms and one final exam, okay? So, yeah, it's, it, it really is fairly fast-paced. If you're getting behind, come see me, okay? Um, I don't keep specific office hours. If you look on the thing, you'll see a link to my calendar where you can see if I'm free or not, because if I'm not in a meeting, I'm in my office. And if I'm in my office, you are always welcome to come by. If you want to schedule a meeting, I'll schedule one for you. Or if you want to just come by, you're always welcome to come by. If I'm talking to somebody else about some other bullshit, okay, then you have priority. If it's not bullshit, then I'll say, hang on. Okay? But that's my policy. Okay? So I want to help you if I can. So general things, biochemistry. Oh, by the way. Uh, if you go to the class webpage, you'll see a link to the syllabus. I expect everybody will read the syllabus, and I know everybody expects everybody's going to read the syllabus. You'll get a question on the first exam on the syllabus. Okay? Make sure you read the syllabus. The syllabus is required reading. All right? Absolutely required reading. There are ways you can lose points if you don't read the syllabus. Okay. One last piece of business before I talk about this. I am videotaping the lectures. For a lot of students, they look at a day like today and they say, oh, wow, man, Ahern is videotaping the lectures, so I know where I am going. That's only fair if I can join you. Okay? No, the point is that I've done the numbers. The students who do well in the class are the students who come to class. All right? That camera is there to help you learn. That camera is not there to drive you away from this class. When the weather is really beautiful outside, what's going to happen is the numbers are going to do this. Okay? Or Friday afternoons, because I want to go home, the numbers are going to do this. And when the numbers start doing this, I start having extra credit for people who are in class. If you're not in class because you decide, hey, I'm going to go, I've got to leave, the weather's great, okay? 
I will give extra credit to people who are in class. If that doesn't work, the camera will go away. So the camera is there to help you learn. The camera is there to supplement your learning. The camera is not there to drive you away. So if you want my strong advice, when the weather's nice, the first thing I would think of doing is going to class. Just a word to the wise, OK? Because that's when most of the people make up points in this class. I had a thing last year where I gave so many extra points for people for coming to class that people who came to class every day got 5% extra on their grade above everybody else. Come to class. You will benefit. OK. All right. Now, now that I've banged you on the head enough, I can bang you on the head with biochemistry. If I'm going to bang you with something, it should be with biochemistry, I think. The chemical foundations of biochemistry. Okay. When we think about biochemistry, we think about what is the chemistry that's going on inside of a living cell. That was the sort of roots of biochemistry when people first started thinking about biochemistry. I learned myself yesterday that the term biochemistry didn't even get coined until the early 1900s. Even though the very first things that we would consider experiments relevant to biochemistry occurred in the 1800s. Okay? One of the very first experiments done in biochemistry was done in the 1800s by a man named Wohler. And he was able to show that he could synthesize in a test tube the compound urea. Okay. By the way, I'm just talking right now. You're not responsible for any of this right now. I'll tell you when I, when I turn the responsibility on. Wohler synthesized urea. We think, so what? Okay. He was the first person to chemically synthesize a biological compound. Prior to that synthesis in the early 1800s, everybody thought that what happened in living cells was A, magical, and B, could only be done in a living cell. What Wohler showed in one experiment was that both of those were wrong. Both of them were wrong. The chemistry that goes on inside of living cells is no different than the chemistry that goes on anywhere else in the world or the universe. And in addition to that, that there was nothing magical about the environment of the cell. You could take it outside the cell, and it would work. Okay? That was a real revolution. It was the very first time people realized that, yes, it might be possible to understand the chemical reactions that happen inside of cells. Okay? Well, we fast forward almost 200 years to where we are right now. We know the existence of virtually every chemical reaction that occurs inside of cells. They're known as metabolic pathways. You're going to see some metabolic pathways this term. Okay. The information that we have in terms of the chemistry, that's long gone. Okay. How does that chemistry happen? Well, that chemistry happens because of enzymes. Enzymes catalyze those reactions. And enzymes are pretty remarkable things, as we will see. But all enzymes are is catalysts. They speed reactions. They don't change reactions. Okay? You learn that in basic chemistry. Enzymes speed reactions. Uh, that, that catalysts speed reactions, and enzymes are just catalysts. They're all they are. Okay? We know the complete DNA sequence of human beings, as well as a few hundred other species. The DNA, of course, contains all the information. You hear this how many times? All the information that the cell uses. Okay? We know all the information. What we're still unraveling, and we probably will for some time, how that information is used, how enzymes are controlled, how metabolic pathways are controlled. You're going to see a fair amount of that this term. And what you're going to understand as a result of learning how metabolic pathways, for example, are controlled is you are going to know how your body works. I find one of the real joys for me in teaching biochemistry is people go, wow, this really is interesting, and I thought it was going to be terrible. I hope you see. Maybe you're just not saying, maybe they're just saying that because they come to see me. I don't know. But I hope that they really think that because that's a really exciting thing. Okay. Well, let's think about this in general terms, okay? The chemical foundations of biochemistry. This, these are a series of names and organic molecules and I'm sure you've all taken an organic chemistry class, and if you haven't, you should. I don't teach this as a chemistry class. 
Do you have to have biochemistry to do this? Well, I think it's a darn good idea. It is a prerequisite for the class. I think it's a darn good idea that you do. And I certainly expect that you're going to know what these general categories of molecules are that you should have gotten from organic chemistry. So I'm not going to review them with you. Okay? If I'm talking about a carboxylic acid, I think you should know what a carboxylic acid is. If I'm talking about an amino acid, you should know what an amino acid is, etc. What a ketone is, what an aldehyde is, these sorts of things. Okay? One of the magical things about biochemistry is the way that information is organized. And information in, in, in um, cells is really remarkable. Cells build macromolecules to store information, to use the information, and to do the work that they need to do. They also use it to store energy, and that's what you see on the screen. DNA, everybody knows. Okay, A, T, G, C, and you know the base pair rules, et cetera. We'll talk more about that. Proteins made of amino acids. Proteins are what I call the workhorses of the cell. Workhorses of the cell. They catalyze the reactions that are necessary for life. Those reactions give energy. Those reactions allow cells to build things. They allow cells to communicate information. Proteins are involved in that communication of the information. We'll see that proteins that exist in your cell membranes are actually the link between the cell and the rest of the world. An isolated cell in your body can talk to another isolated cell in your body using hormones. Okay? You find that hormones are really useful and proteins are playing that communications role. You have a cell phone, right? You take the cell phone out. The cell phone is your end of communications. That cell phone goes and talks to a receiver somewhere, right? That receiver is the protein. That protein is the mediator of the signal. The mediator of the signal. It is communicating that back and forth. Cells don't communicate without energy, okay? Just like you don't communicate without energy when your cell battery runs down and it's dead, you're not going to talk to anyone except by shouting at them. Okay? Cells need energy stores, and they store energy and use energy mostly in the form of carbohydrates and fats. We'll find fats are the most efficient way for them to store energy, but carbohydrates are the fastest form of energy. The fastest. Okay? Okay. Let's continue on. And by the way, I'm now starting to wade into things that you will be responsible for. How do cells make macromolecules? Well, they make macromolecules by combining building blocks into bigger things. You'll hear me talk a lot about building blocks. What's the building block of proteins? Well, the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. There are 20 of them. Do we have to memorize the structure of all 20 amino acids? No. But there are some basic things about them that you'll need to know, and I'll talk to you about them. I try to keep your memorization of structures in this class as minimal as I can. Because there's enough things to learn. The more things I give you to memorize, the less time you have to learn. I want you to learn. But there's a certain amount of, if you want to walk the walk, you've got to talk the talk. So there's a certain language, and part of any class, especially a biochemistry class, is learning the language. So that's something that we're going to have to get comfortable with and familiar with, is learning that language, and that's where you're going to think memorization. Okay? There's going to be some things that you're going to need to learn in that respect. Okay, so we see various things being put together. There's amino acids. One amino acid gets linked to another. It makes two of them join together covalently. There's one nucleotide being linked to another nucleotide. The two of them get joined together to make a dinucleotide. Here's one sugar joined to another sugar. We get these together and they make a disaccharide. Macromolecules just continue this process over and over and over and over. By far, the most giant molecules that you have in your cells are DNA, by a long ways. Proteins don't even come close, although they are very large themselves. You'll probably hear me say this statistic over and over during the term, but I just find it remarkable that in every cell of your body, Every single cell of your body, if you took 
the DNA from that one cell and you stretch it out end to end. One cell, smaller than your eye can see, holds seven feet of DNA. That's pretty hard to get your head around. It tells you it's got to be wrapped up. It's got to be coiled up. Because if cells don't do that, they're going to be seven feet big to hold it. Okay? DNA is a mondo, humongous molecule. That's good because the more information your cells have, the better off you are. DNA has another magical property, and that magical property is that it contains enough information in each strand of the double helix to make the other strand. That's why the base pairing rules are important. G pairs with C. In this case, it's, a, a, um, it's actually RNA with DNA. It's got U's in there. But in each case, that pairing okay, specifies what the other strand is going to be. Not a problem. How did life on Earth come about? It's a question we've asked for ages. And one of the things that we're learning about how life on Earth came about is from the study of what are called self-replicating molecules. It's now known that RNA, another form of nucleic acid, RNA can, in fact, catalyze reactions. Proteins aren't the only things that catalyze reactions. And it's thought that the very first RNAs that led to life were self-replicating. They could duplicate themselves, as you see on this screen here. They could duplicate themselves. And as a result of duplicating themselves, they eventually gave rise to coding, and coding gave rise to proteins, and everything was downhill from there. We're going to talk this class not about biology, but we will briefly talk about a few groups in biology. Okay? We talk about bacteria, which we will call prokaryotes. We talk about human beings and dogs and cats and plants, and we call them eukaryotes. And by the way, I hate this thing right here. Whenever you see it jumping, just scream at me, and I will make it quit. They will not turn that thing off. Okay. Archaeans are sort of an odd group, and we won't really say much about them. I only have one thing I say about them during the whole term. But when I talk about prokaryotes and eukaryotes, what you'll see is that these divisions in biology are important from a biochemical level. Prokaryotes do some things differently than eukaryotes do. What you will be amazed about is how little difference there is. Very, very little difference. If we look at, for example, bacteria. I've got a gut full of E. coli. Okay? E. coli is very abundant in my system. E. coli smells like poop. It's why your poop smells like poop, in fact. Okay? You have billions of E. coli in your digestive system. They're single-celled organisms, okay? Single-celled organisms. Those organisms use exactly the same genetic information as your cells do. Exactly the same. The genetic code is the same. More importantly than that, when we look at the metabolic pathways that those bacteria have, they're almost identical to yours. When we look at the structure of the proteins that are involved in catalyzing those reactions, in many cases, they're almost identical to yours. We do find differences in biology, but the similarities that we find are absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. So where there are differences, I will point them out, and I'll say prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are all unicellular, all single-celled organisms. Eukaryotes are mostly multicellular, but there are some unicellular eukaryotes. Yeast, for example, is a eukaryote, but it's a unicellular organism. We use yeast to make beer, you enologists. We use it to make bread. We use it to make gasohol. We do all kinds of things with single-cell eukaryotes like yeast. A really cool eukaryote I used to work on when I was, did my postdoc is right there, slime molds. Have you ever seen slime molds before? You like them? slime molds? Cool? Yeah. They're really bizarre little organs. They have a, they have a part of their life, life cycle that is unicellular and a part of it that's multicellular. Really cool, weird little bugs. Okay. 
One of the big differences we see in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes is in the composition of their organelles. An organelle is a substructure inside of a cell. What we see is that prokaryotes have virtually no organelles. Okay? They don't have a nucleus. Their DNA is just floating around inside. Our cells have a nucleus. It's a place to hold the DNA, Gesundheit, a place to make the RNA. What organelles give a cell is the ability to sequester something. Sequester it. You can keep it isolated. Okay? A cell membrane. Yes, we both have cell membranes, but that's not exactly an organelle because if you didn't have a membrane, you wouldn't be a cell. Mitochondria. Mitochondria are what we call the power plants of the cell. You have basic cell biology or basic biology. You've learned about mitochondria. We say that mitochondria are where the ATP is made. Probably 99% of the ATP in a cell is made in the mitochondria. It's no surprise we call that the power plant of the cell. Okay? We'll talk more about mitochondria later. The endoplasmic reticulum. Again, look at all these. None of these in prokaryotes except for the membrane. All right? The endoplasmic reticulum is an organelle in eukaryotic cells that's important in making certain kinds of proteins. Certain kinds of proteins are made there. Chloroplasts, of course, you botanists in here, the botanist, botany mafia, it's not a mafia now, I'm very happy to hear. The botany mafia knows that chloroplasts, of course, are organelles that are in plants, which is where photosynthesis is occurring. Okay? Very, very important um, things. So prokaryotes don't have those, eukaryotes have those. I like that picture. There's the reason your poop smells like poop. Doesn't it kind of look like poop too? For what it's worth. Extremophiles. These are the Archaeans. I, talked about, I said I mentioned briefly the Archaeans. The Archaeans are a more, the most recently discovered form of life on Earth. And they live, the reason they're the most recently discovered is they live in these bizarre environments. Okay. They can live under conditions that many other cells would die in. Very alkaline environments, very acidic environments, very salty environments, very hot environments. Okay? They're called extremophiles because they can tolerate many different environments that other, other cells cannot tolerate. Here's a schematic of a, an animal cell. Okay? It just shows some of those organelles that I talked about. It has a lot of other structures. And no, I'm not going to ask you to draw artistically an animal cell on an exam. Okay? I just show this to you to give you sort of an acquaintance about what we're looking at in terms of structures that are there. Plant cells differ from animal cells, mostly in having chloroplasts, but also in having different structures in their cell wall. We don't really have a cell wall as such. We have a membrane that's kind of gushy, mushy. Plants have a pretty rigid membrane pretty rigid membrane. They use cellulose to make up their cell wall. We don't have that in ours. So plants are a lot harder to work with if you're trying to stick things into them when you're working in a laboratory, for example. Okay? Plants have chloroplasts. Plants also have mitochondria. We don't think about that so much. We think about, oh, they can use the sun. Well, of course, the sun is only out 12 hours a day, right? In Oregon, in the wintertime, it's out about, it seems like about four hours a day, right? What's a plant do when it's dark? It's still going to have energy. Mitochondria are very important for plants when the, when the light is not there. Another thing that cells have that's important is a cytoskeleton. What does that mean? Well, literally, in addition to your body having a macroskeleton, the bones and so forth of your body, every cell in your body has internal structures that are not unlike the skeleton we have in our macroscopic body. It's called a cytoskeleton. And these fibers have been stained to illustrate for you. Those little blue guys there are nuclei. Okay? These are individual cells. But you can see these fibrous structures that are in there that give support and structure to cells. So the cytoskeleton is a very important uh, thing for um, our cells to have. There's a bunch of organelle functions and a bunch of names. And by the way, I'm showing you these on the screen. Just because I showed them on the screen doesn't mean, okay, now we've got to go memorize those, right? right? 
talk about them. That's fair game. If I don't talk about them, you can kind of figure where things are headed, right? Okay. All right. Um, energy is critical for life. Okay. I want to repeat that. All right. It's a very, very important thing. Energy is critical for life. Why is energy critical for life? Okay. Well, how many people know what entropy is? What's that? Your, 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 your room? Okay. Yeah. Energy is uh, entropy is chaos. Entropy is the tendency for things to mix. Entropy is the tendency for things to get more mixed up, not less mixed up. When we look at living systems, we say, whoa, they're really organized. Look at that cytoskeleton you saw there. It was very organized. Look at the DNA. It's very organized. It's got to be very organized to fit seven feet inside of DNA, in, inside of a cell. Does that mean that living cells are violating the principle of entropy increasing in the universe? It's not a closed system. It's not a closed system. Okay. That's one thing. How do we overcome the tendency for entropy? Well, it turns out it's very simple. If I have a deck of cards and I've been playing solitaire and I have my deck of cards and it has the two of hearts next to the three of hearts, next to the four of hearts, next to the five of hearts, and all the cards are organized beautifully in this deck, and I take the deck and I throw it up in the air and I pick up the deck, the likelihood that it's going to be in that same order, not so high, right? That's entropy, right? If I put energy into sorting that deck and putting them back in the direction that they were, I can overcome entropy. It takes energy to overcome entropy. That's part of the reason that cells absolutely have to have energy. We'll see there's others. But if cells cannot overcome that tendency towards entropy, they will not exist. They require energy to do that. Now we think of cells, oh, I have to have energy to jump and run and jog. I'm a jogger. I like to jog. Okay. Yeah, I have to have energy for those things as well. But at the very most basic level, cells have to have energy to overcome that tendency for entropy. Okay? Where do they get the energy from? Well, there's quite a variety of ways in which cells get energy, but the way that they store energy is really interesting. They store energy in a couple of forms. The most immediate form that they store it in is ATP. Everybody's heard about ATP. ATP is what I call the gasoline of the cell. Okay? Gasoline's great because you can go anywhere you want and you find a gas station and you can get filled up and you're on your way. It's a universal energy source. ATP is a universal energy source. Cells can use it to make molecules. Cells can use it to send messages. Cells can use it to duplicate their genetic information. It's a universal source. Okay? High energy phosphates are great ways of storing energy. That's what, that's what ATP is, a molecule that has high energy phosphates. Putting three phosphates together on the end of a molecule, okay? is something that three phosphates really don't want to have happen. They repel each other. Phosphate is negative. Put one negative next to a negative and join it with a covalent bond. They're repelling each other, but they're held together by a covalent bond. Guess what happens when somebody releases that covalent bond? Poof! They fly apart, energy is released. Put three of them together. That's what ATP is, adenosine triphosphate, one, two, three. Man, they really do want to get apart. You give them the chance to fly apart, energy will be released. ATP is a great source of energy. That's an immediate source. I need energy right now. If I decide to go and this building catches on fire and I want to get out of here as quickly as I can, I'm going to run and I'm going to burn ATP and I'm not even going to think about it. I'm running the Corvallis Half Marathon in two weeks, less than two weeks now. Okay? I'm going to burn some ATP there, but I'm probably not going to have enough ATP all by itself to run that race. I've got to have things that can make ATP for me. It's kind of like a little gas all generator as I get going along. 
that's going to do that. So I have other molecules that have stored energy that can be used to make ATP, because my muscles are going to use ATP. Fat. Okay. You guys thought I was just fat, but I'm just carrying this around so I can run the half marathon. <laughs> okay. Fat is a great storage of energy. One of the things that runners do before a race, and no, I'm, I'm not a racer, I'm a runner. There's a very big difference, by the way. Okay. Runners run because they enjoy running. Racers run because they hate running. They want to see how fast they can do it. Okay. So I'm a runner. I like to run. I forget what that was headed. Oh, I know what it was. So runners, racers and runners, before a big run, will do what's called carbo-loading. How many people here carbo-load? Everybody? Oh, okay, you guys know what that is. All right. Why am I carbo-loading? Well, carbo-loading, I'm eating a lot of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates give sugars. And sugars are very, very good quick energy sources. And my muscles and my liver can store those for a short period of time. I don't store sugars like I store fat. Fat, I really work to get rid of. I really do. Okay? Sugars, I don't get to keep with me for very long. In fact, the sugars that I have in my body in the form of carbohydrate, I have about a 24-hour supply of carbohydrate. 24 hours. If I don't eat for 24 hours, I can run my carbohydrate down pretty low. Does that mean I'm going to die? No. It means I've got other, other ways of making energy. But I can exhaust my carbohydrate fairly readily. So if I boost my carbohydrate, at least transiently, that can help me during a run. And yes, it does help during a run. I usually like to go get a big thing of ice cream before I run. That's always, a lot of, always good. All right. So these are important for us uh, to stay alive, to run, to jump, to do all the things that we want to do. Okay, what am I doing on time? Just about out of time. There's adenosine triphosphate, okay? There is ribose, there is, aden there is adenine, and there's those three phosphates that really don't want to be next to each other. Think about what you're taught about in physics with respect to potential energy, okay? Potential energy. Imagine that you take a ball and you roll it up a hill. What are you doing? You're increasing the potential energy for that, that system, right? Because once you let go of that ball, it rolls down the hill, right? Okay? That's a very, very important visual uh, thing to think about, and that's exactly what's happening with ATP. Cells are putting together phosphates that really don't want to go together because when that bond between them is broken, energy will be released. That is a lot of potential energy a lot of potential energy. And being able to use that energy to do meaningful things, whether it's working, jumping, running, studying, watching the tube, hope you're not using, doing too much of that, okay? That is all very useful. Okay. I picked this one out because it's kind of bizarre, you know? We think about the various bizarre forms of energy that are out there. It doesn't get much weirder than an electric ray. These guys kill their prey by electrocuting them. And they do it because they generate an enormous electrical potential. We'll see a little bit about how that occurs later in the class. But it tells us that living systems are perfectly capable of doing the very same things that human beings go out and try to make with systems. Whether it's an electric ray, as we see here, whether it's a nanomachine, as many engineers are working on, or whether it's a real world generator that uh, makes a lot of energy and electricity. We'll see examples of all these things this term. And with that, I will shut up. See you guys tomorrow. Yes, sir. You're talking about entropy, and you're using energy to help contain entropy from occurring.